So without further ado, um, we'd like to welcome our next uh, speakers to the stand. So please welcome Peter Venesh and Giuseppe Serio. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation, Automotive Threat Intelligence Product versus IT Cybersecurity. My name is Peter Venes. I am a Threat Intelligence Manager from Thyssen Group. That's, by the way, a really old picture, so sorry for that. Uh, I've uh, been touring Europe for the last uh, couple of years as a threat intelligence person. And my friend here is... Yeah, my pleasure to be with you today. My name is Giuseppe Zerio. I'm the VP of Market Development at uh, Upstream. Been in the auto industry for more than 20 years. Um, all, all over the places, uh, but uh, predominantly in uh, connected vehicle and automotive cyber security. Just to tell you a couple of words about uh, our company. So I work for Thyssen Group and this will be very important in the later uh, stages. So as you can see, we are uh, a manufacturing company and we basically manufacture everything that has a connection to steel. So. You can see some steel things on the uh, screen. Submarines, we have a submarine division. And of course, as you might have seen my uh, colleague's presentation in the morning, we are also producing car parts. So uh, you can see our sales there, our employees. So you can see we are a huge company. And uh, we have partnered with Upstream yeah, and uh, a few words about Upstream. So Upstream is uh, an Israeli company that was established in 2017 uh, in Israel. And uh, we do cyber security and data management uh, tooling, but also services in the threat intelligence space where we collaborate with uh, our partner Tizen Krupp. As well as uh, these days, it's really important to have uh, vehicle security operations centers. So we operate also vehicle security operations centers for our customers. And as you can see, maybe just a, a quick, so um, uh, some of our investors are from the automotive domain, um, where, where automotive industry is located in the big three regions. And today we have more than 12 million connected vehicle on our platform that we are monitor day by day. I'm here to deliver a very important message today. This message is that the automotive industry doesn't care about patch Tuesdays. I can see some frowns. Yeah, because uh, basically this is false. The automotive industry does care about patch Tuesdays. So uh, I have uh, brilliant colleagues in the uh, IT space who are patching their uh, software and our software, in fact, so that everything's up to date and everything works. Um, and that's great, but I am a product cybersecurity person, so I don't care about Patch Tuesdays. And again, this is untrue. We in the automotive industry use a lot of uh, software which is open source. These are uh, patched regularly. So if we didn't patch our tools and our tooling used in, uh, in uh, production or in the products, then we, we would be in a, a very bad space and we'd have vulnerabilities which we wouldn't want. So that's why this is partially false. While we do care that uh, uh, the infrastructure our development is uh, running on is up to date, uh, my Christmases usually aren't ruined by uh, uh, extreme vulnerabilities like Log4j or the SolarWinds vulnerability, which, was, which happened about two years ago. However, there is one thing I'm really concerned about and that's something I don't see in the automotive industry, uh, be it uh, OEMs, so car manufacturers, 
or suppliers. I'm really concerned that there is or there are no patch Tuesdays in the automotive sector. You can see some uh, vulnerabilities released for um, large American uh, self-driving cars. So there are CVs for that brand, uh, but uh, there it's not common for the industry to release their uh, vulnerabilities. In a way, you can see that in the IT space, which from one standpoint makes sense because uh, you, if you would uh, make your vulnerabilities public, that would open a whole can of worms that would be um, unfortunate for car manufacturers and uh, tier one suppliers such as ourselves. So what we are doing is that we need to better understand the threat landscape. So we need to understand who is targeting us, who is targeting the car makers, who is targeting the uh, automotive suppliers, and in fact, who will target us in five years? Uh, what will be used to target us? What kind of uh, tools, uh, protocols, and techniques will be used to target us? Currently, thankfully, most of the targeting is uh, from uh, re security researchers and white hat hackers, but Giuseppe will talk about targeting in a minute. But what will happen in five years when there will be smart cities and connected ecosystems? That's something we need to work for diligently to be able to predict beforehand what will be used to attack us. However, there are the cybersecurity of uh, uh, car manufacturing is still a new thing. I hope you haven't seen any uh, self-driving cars that have been hacked uh, on your way here. I haven't, so uh, that means this is uh, still not as prevalent as we assume it to be in the near term. But if there are rumors that there is a vulnerability out there, or if there is an attack out there, that could be as damaging as the vulnerability itself, because people would panic, people want, wouldn't want to sit in their cars, and that would be bad for everyone. So we needed to find a new approach to find relevant threat intelligence. But first, let's talk about threat intelligence in the automotive sector. It's uh, similar to the uh, IT threat intelligence. So uh, we have our priority uh, intelligence requirements, which uh, for me, number one is to protect and predict what kind of attacks will uh, impact our products. My second priority is to protect the local company. And additionally, if I find anything that's useful for the group, then uh, I will act upon it. We work uh, according to the threat intelligence lifecycle. And uh, what we research is uh, open source intelligence, human intelligence. This could be any of you. Uh, so sometimes security researchers come to me uh, describing a vulnerability. And sometimes internal colleagues come to me when they find something, which is great. And we also get a closed source intelligence. This would be if uh, I was a, um, if this was five years ago, I would say the deep and dark web, but uh, we all know that the deep and dark web is not so deep and so dark as uh, it, it, we believed so five years ago. However, there are certain risks coming from the, uh, let's call it dark web for simplicity and one of the reasons we partnered with Upstream is to get a better understanding on uh, what kind of threats are impacting us and what kind of threats will impact us in the near, medium, or long term. Giuseppe? Yeah, so <clears throat> this brings Upstream into the conversation. So um, I don't know how many of you are in the auto industry, but uh, if you are or you happen to come across uh, the uh, yearly 
report that we uh, publish, uh, you may be acquainted with uh, uh, the risks that are in the automotive industry. So we do this uh, every year, 90 pages long, and we discuss and talk what's new, what are the new threats that uh, companies need to care about and what needs to be addressed in order to stay resilient. Now, when we look at the things, it's not just for the sake of hacking or um, the attacks that we are seeing uh, obviously have a monetary aspect to it. Uh, the sentence, follow the money, is always true. And as you can see from the slide, the auto industry is uh, suffering big losses from cyber attack. Now, arguably, this is everything cyber, but more and more, we are getting into the main where not only the IT is affected, but more importantly, the products, the services of the customers, so the OEM and the supply chain is affected. And to stress that point, as you can see from the graph, the activities in cyber have been skyrocketing. So there's a 344% increase in cyber incidents over the last 10 years. And it's uh, really significant. So that's why it's important to be sensitive, be aware of uh, this scenario. And I will elaborate later more um, on the specifics of the types of attack. For now, maybe uh, Peter, you can talk about why it's important for the auto industry, what, sh what use cases. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, I've put a couple of uh, use cases together which might be um, important in the medium to long term uh, and that might impact the industry as a whole. So the first risk we expect is a vehicle as a service use case. So uh, you all know there is a <clears throat> very well-known uh, brand of uh, car makers who have recently um, created a service where they charge a set number of uh, money for to enable their uh, seat heating. And um, so this is well known. Uh, we expect other car makers to follow suit. And there were already uh, dissatisfied customers who have uh, looked for alternative solutions to prevent paying money. So that means, if I want to speak plainly, is they were looking for uh, patches, or should I say cracks, to um, enable their uh, heat seating uh, for free. We expect that uh, there will be a demand from, not only from these customers, but once there will be an increase in, uh, in this type of service offering by uh, other car makers. Uh, the demand will likely drive the hacking market, so to speak. This means if there's a demand, then there will be uh, solutions providers uh, who operate either clandestinely or, or openly, and these people will uh, sell these patches or cracks to individuals. But you only need a small logical step to see what if these patches or cracks uh, wouldn't help the customer, the dissatisfied customer, but what if these would uh, include uh, ransomware or other types of attacks? That would open up the uh, car industry to uh, similar threats that the uh, IT industry is facing today. So this is one of the uh, uh, use cases we are looking at. And the other one is the uh, elephant in the room. Of course, I'm talking about uh, the uh, self-driving cars. So these are a very long way out. Uh, if someone was expecting to uh, uh, have a self-driving car very soon, and I'm not talking about that specific brand of cars, which the automotive industry doesn't regard as a full self-driving car at the moment. But these cars will happen. And uh, when these cars will happen, it's uh, logical to say that these will be more complex 
than uh, regular cars. Uh, normal cars today are very complex, have a lot of uh, IT equipment, as you have, again, seen from my uh, colleague in the morning. But uh, self-driving cars will be more complex than uh, regular cars. And we all know from the IT industry is that the more complex systems are, they will be more harder to secure. And we need to be aware of uh, what's happening in the self-driving car space and what their security flaws are because uh, there will be security flaws and these flaws will likely increase by time. So speaking of risks, I will give the word back to Giuseppe who will talk about these risks. I'll step here. Right, so every one of us is uh, affected. So in fact, everyone either drives a car if you don't drive a car, you uh, maybe happen to rent a car or you use mobility services, which are very common these uh, days. So we are all affected at the end of the day. And the point that we want to stress out is this is not just theory. This is not just thinking that uh, we need to protect something which is fictitious. Actually, it's really uh, happening today. And as you can see from those charts, what I want you to take away is two things. One, more than 57 or 57 percent of the attacks are actually carried out by the bad guys. So it's no longer the researchers, which was the case in uh, the 2015, 2016, 17. But now there is a monetary interest, as Peter explained. So all the use cases, the, the services that we expect from our cars or from our mobility provider to unlock uh, customer centricity and for the customers or for the OEMs uh, unlock new revenue streams actually is pretty much affected. So the other thing to note is that in the industry, and Peter you mentioned it's still somewhat in the infancy, um, automotive cybersecurity is not a big thing in terms of years like we know in the IT industry. It's like 2014, 2015, even there was one pivotal moment with the famous uh, GPAC in 2015 where it was proven that you could do something to vehicles on the road as they drive. So if you see on the left hand side of the chart, uh, it's about 60% of the CVEs in the auto space from 2016 to 21 actually were medium or high severity. And that tells you something that we need to do something about it. And another number that I want to share with you is 253%. Um, it's skyrocketing from last year to this year, uh, the increase by the incidents that we have been able to uh, unlock and understand that are uh, happening out in the wild. So it's really important to look not only at uh, this exposure and the use cases, and to give you another flavor, you see a chart. So what are attackers today carrying out? What, what is their target? What, what is the interest? And um, as you can see from, from the chart here is, it's uh, the privacy, so it's a service on one hand. On the other hand, stolen cars, key fobs. That's a big thing. You hear that all over the places. But more importantly, and this is the number on the left-hand side, so 7.3% of all new incidents are because of the interaction with a mobile app. Think for a moment about that. It doubled in the last year alone, meaning that while we try to protect, and you see the attacks on the right-hand side, so this is the embedded stuff, infotainment, OBD2 ports, Wi-Fi, networking, Bluetooth, you name it. We know there is issues, but from a percentage perspective, they're lower than the new things. And it, it's true that uh, uh, the industry is going a massive shift from becoming an engineering company, mechanical engineering towards a software company. And it's said that software is eating up hardware now APIs, the mobility, is eating up the software. 
Uh, that's the next big thing, because we all expect the same usage with our smartphones that we know uh, in other domains. Yeah? Doing shopping, banking, you, you have this interaction. That will become the next wave of attacks as we see it. And um, in that context, we need to be very careful what uh, we need to, to do and protect. Now, Peter, you talked about um, complexity. I think it's benefit, if you are not in the auto industry, you might say, well, what's, what's the difference between protecting a cyber physical system like a vehicle and the IT space? I would summarize there are four major differences. So one is you need to look at the vehicle complexity. Um, I will have a quiz with you later on. Uh, I'm curious to see your response, so wait for that. Um, the car, as I mentioned, is becoming a software product. In software, we know it's, uh, it's complex and there's vulnerability inherently in uh, what we built. So humans are just bad at coding. So uh, that's the fact. So we need to keep up with, with security. But also the backend system that we are adding. Um, the car was not used to be connected. It, it was built and sold. And there was a little bit of aftermarket servicing, but that's it. Today it's connected and it stays connected for the entire life cycle. So that's adding complexity. And we want to do those services which need to interact with the backend system, payment, billing, uh, information sharing. We want the car to become the center of our digital life like we used with a smartphone. So we're transferring information. The backend system is really, really important and the connected services around it are exposed. And then the supply chain, and we know exactly what we're talking about. Um, the supply chain, if you think for a moment today, there is this chip crisis. It's very easy to have counterfeit products if you don't really pay attention to your products and follow the entire chain, where it's coming from. Is there anything that you need to be aware of in, in that uh, chain? And I mentioned the lifetime is really important and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. And last but not least, the threat landscape is exploding. Again, the car used to be just a car, you drive from A to B and that's it. Today, you can do even um, emails, you can do payments, you have services that come with the car. But more importantly, we now enable a feature which is good but bad in the same time, meaning we enable over the air update, which is a new attack vector. We go into electrification. Now we hook up our cars to the grid and the charging station. They are exposing. So all of that new technology, all new features, all new um, capabilities, they are bringing a plethora of new uh, attack vectors to the industry. And again, I mentioned it's important not to look just at the product because the product is just a small part out of a smart mobility ecosystem. In other words, if you have the highest barrier, you do all the right things in the vehicle, all the security elements that we know from the IT, they have been more or less passed and transported and embedded by now into the vehicle. But that's not enough. It's like if you just care in a bank to protect the safe while the robber is already in front of the door of the safe. Obviously, you want to protect even people from getting into the building. Meaning, you need to understand the entire ecosystem and exposure. And I challenge on this very much the industry, telling it's difficult to define what is a cybersecurity use case and what not. For a simple reason, we have some use cases which we want to happen on purpose, like you want to open the car with a smartphone, do a transaction. That is a very normal use case. There's no cyber in it. But if the car is opened with a command that comes from the other side of the world, that's suspicious. That's something you want to look into. And you need that intelligence that's inside in order to able to connect the dots. 
context is key and it's just not about the product because that's only raising the bar and I used to say between the bar as high as it is there's still the sky and between there there's always room for hackers to get in and we know it's a daily thing now more onto it if you are in the IT industry and not so much acquainted with automotive I'd like to share four areas uh, of uh, thinking now we all understand in the industry that uh, attacking is always easier but you mentioned complexity and complexity is a big thing um, we'll have the quiz on that in a moment and there are new vulnerabilities in the interconnections we know this from IT as well but think for a moment in the automotive domain 90% of innovation in the auto industry is driven out of software if you build a car that's 30,000 on average pieces components coming from two dozen of different suppliers that's complexity that how do you build that and to make things work worse a product the very same car and model that you drive they may look from the outside identical but they're not it's not like having a same computer a Mac or a, a, a HP that you replicate with the same components and then you look into the security now because of diversification strategies sourcing strategies availability different markets different regulation car makers there is no one car that is equal to the other that is complexity and uh, that's important to keep in mind the third thing is the internet we know this as well very much in the IT industry it empowers attackers because now things can scale in an organization how many laptops or devices can you have it's uh, very much analogous to the number of employees maybe that you have and service so that number stays more or less stable if you are Toyota or Volkswagen or General Motors you add 10 million new devices on the road every year that's skyrocketing and you need to protect them over the life cycle and again the life cycle in the automotive industry is probably one of the uh, most difficult thing to handle because think of commercial vehicle tractors buses they are out on the road for 40 years eventually um, has ever, anyone in the IT industry tried to keep something secure for more than eight 10 years think of Microsoft and XP eight nine years and out or the economics as I mentioned here don't trickle down because if you think in terms of your smartphone for instance every three four years you change it you have a whole new system with new hardware security mechanism etc etc that's the challenge in the auto industry it's really really hard in that complexity to, to thrive and survive and, and, and keep that also economically uh, safe now I promised you the quiz so a few number just because otherwise everything seems like theory let's talk about numbers they don't lie so how many human brain cells do you think we have don't look to your neighbor I'm asking a general question <laughs> tell me numbers so it's 11 zeros two point the extension of 11 if we look at the atoms anyone wants to shoot how many zeros just guess no one 49 let's go ahead how many atoms in the universe do you have that we have 88 zeros and now you you would expect it automotive right it's a rhetorical question shoot me how many zeros do we have and by the way I want you to know that this is a Mercedes E-Class because that's one of the single sources that we were able to find from 2010 it's the complexity of 2010 which is far beyond what we have today and give me a number come on don't be so shy 90 that's not bad 103 that is the takeaway 
That is why automotive cybersecurity is so complex. Yeah? That, that gives you an idea and a flavor. Now, just quickly, what is the industry doing? Are we just talking about it, or is there something that needs to be done about it? And in the industry, uh, since this year in July, there is a new regulation, which is uh, the UNSE WP29, or uh, it's the R155-156, that's the technical term about it. And what you need to do as an OEM, if you're part of the UNSCE countries, which are 58 states, predominantly Europe, Asia, um, some South African, Japan, you have to have a cybersecurity management system in place, a governance model, and this is typically done in the industry in a vehicle security operation center. And on top of it, for the software update management, if there is the ability to update software, uh, no matter if it's, uh, by the way, over the air or you do it in a service shop, you need to have a management system that would look into versioning. So all the stuff that we know from traditional IT. So it's hating the barrier because we as a consumer need to expect safe cars at the end of the day, or at least we should strive to have um, resilience in, in, in the things that we build. So that's effective for new vehicle types this year. 2024, it will be effective for all vehicle types. And what it means is if a car maker doesn't comply with that regulation, they will not get the homologation, meaning they cannot sell cars, which is a big thing if you are in the auto industry selling cars. So what does it mean for all the other countries, you may ask, so like US and South America? Obviously, very much like GDPR, this will raise the bar. And if you want to sell American cars in the US or cars that are built in the US but sold in North Korea, for instance, um, you have to abide to those uh, regulations. So effectively, although the other countries are not part of the UNSCE, it raises the bar for the entire industry. So from a consumer perspective, um, there's a, a little bit of a relief, hopefully, that uh, <laughs> I'm able to give you something is being done. But there's a lot of work to do. That's why in the industry, we partner together. Uh, there's different bodies and organizations who uh, come together, industry, supplier, OEM, uh, to work together because this is something that is affecting everybody and everybody should care about it and uh, uh, be prepared to stay resilient. Yeah, so uh, you're right, Giuseppe. So we need to be prepared and we need to work together. Uh, but we also need to align uh, our intelligence activities. So we need to align threat intelligence. Uh, we need to align the strategic and operative goals. So if we go back to what I said a bit earlier, so PIRs, Priority Intelligence Requirements, which are the heart and soul of uh, what a threat intelligence team does because it defines what our goals should be when we are looking out uh, into the web. So uh, just a re quick recap, I'm mostly focused on our products. Uh, my second focus is the uh, Hungarian part of the company and the third focus is on the Thyssen Group Group. For getting intelligence, we need to do trend research. We need to see what the uh, threat actors' repositories are, and we need a dedicated and good sources to get the good intelligence. However, uh, you are uh, familiar, or you should be familiar with the butterfly effect. If you don't, there is a comic on it. So there might be uh, instances of uh, strategic intelligence that could impact the operations. So you might have heard that there was no, no rain in China for uh, a month, I think. And what was the effect? Some car making factories were shut down because of the heat wave. And um, you might be also familiar, I hope you are familiar with the war in uh, in Ukraine. So uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, there were a lot of uh, car suppliers who were uh, 
uh, hit due to the uh, war and they weren't able to produce parts for the car makers. If strategic intelligence like this happens and we find them, then we can prepare for, uh, for example, uh, if uh, there are no car parts coming in, then the car makers won't order uh, car parts from us. That's something we need to predict. This is something we can't pre prevent, but uh, we can predict this. Um, the winter is coming, so uh, 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 winter might pose also a challenge to the car industry, but we'll see about that. So this was the strategic intelligence. However, black hats or hackers are uh, still the main source of our intelligence. And that was uh, my takeaway. So uh, there are two faces to each coin. The strategic and operational is both uh, very much needed for uh, effective intelligence operations in the automotive industry, similarly to the IT as well. So. Yeah, and after talking about theory, challenges, issues, resolution, maybe just uh, the last two slides. One slide is, okay, so hands-on, under the hood, what is it that uh, jointly we do in working together? One is bringing in the automotive expertise that the teams have to understand the automotive threat landscape, monitoring constantly day by day, understanding how this relates to the regulatory compliance because uh, tier ones need to provide reporting to their OEMs where they su uh, supply the product. On the other side, it's important to have uh, early detection, warning systems, um, being really part of the deep and dark web to hear those, uh, listening to those rumors, be aware what uh, is uh, at risk. Um, and last but not least, once we learn about, even if it is a rumor, as you said, start investigating what can we do about it. Is this something serious? Is this something that we need to take an active response? Do we need to do something about it? How do we prioritize it? That's the kind of day-to-day -day work. And last slide, the uh, sources of where we get the intelligence beside being the own sources, meaning the research team of Upstream, um, being part of that, uh, that uh, ecosystem, looking in deep and dark web, but also uh, the clear web. I mentioned the report. Obviously, the report is based on clear web data, uh, because otherwise uh, it's, it's, uh, it's rumors. So uh, stating the fact is uh, um, the base for, for the reporting. Um, but last but not least, uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, the session and uh, you had some takeaways and you're curious about the industries and uh, the challenges and want to learn more. And uh, with that, I think uh, we both uh, want to say thank you for your attention, your time. Um, yeah, Thanks. thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'm sure you'll agree that was a very cool, calm and collected uh, presentation full of interesting facts and figures. Very well done. Thanks for that, Petter and uh, Jepi. Um, can't say name. Thank you.